From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's just the tip stirs with Melissa Morgan. Tag, you're it. If you've got a tip for Melissa, the facts that no one else has on a cold case, the final clue to solve a vexing mystery, what the customer service number is for lousy customer service, anything. Tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837 or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. And now here's your host, daring to go where no podcaster has gone before. As long as she can pack her Louis Vuitton makeup bag and at least one animal print overcoat, <laughs> Melissa Morgan! <laughs> More cowbell! It's, it's like you know me so well, producer Mark. Well, it's not like I'm married to you or anything. Yeah, right. Yeah, animal print. Co- at least one animal print coat. I have numerous. It's very bad. It's- I I try to find the ones that don't make me look like I'm a giant yeti, like running through the woods. Oh, stop. Okay. They all look adorable. Yeah, I'm. I have a animal print uh, love. It's yes. very immature, but I can't help it. Even as an old lady, I want to wear crazy animal print clothing. It looks good on you. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. That's very sweet of you. So this uh, episode is layered in a way that I, I will try and explain. But before I get to what is possibly the most complicated episode we've done, um, I need to say thank you to Tipster Karen, our newest patron, who is going to get her hiney spanked. Um, if if only uh, my beloved friends are going to be patrons, I'm just, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's, you know, it's the nicest, most wonderful thing to show your support for this podcast. And we appreciate it. Like, in a way, we can't thank you enough. But don't say but. Now, come on. <laughs> Unless you want to talk about spanking butts again. <laughs> yeah, Tipster Karen knows she's in for it uh, when next I see her. she She's going to have to wear some padded drawers because I'm going to spank her hiney. Um, we are really grateful for those of you who take the time uh, to rate and review and subscribe. And that is a, a good thing. I'm really blessed that we have those people in our lives because without you, there's no us. So thank you for being you, all of you wonderful people. Uh, this case, I think I haven't worked as long on any case as this one, was brought to my attention by a listener in another country. She is originally from the United States, from the state of Indiana uh, in particular. And she moved away quite quite a few years ago, probably two decades ago, with some other family members. And <laughs> when she first messaged me about the case, I was like, she might be insane. Because I wasn't sure <laughs> that that all the things she were was telling me were correct. Because it was just well, and then the, and then this person, and then this person, and they're married, but they're siblings, and those siblings are married to other siblings. And I was like, "She's fucking with me." It's just I don't. She's totally fucking with me, but she wasn't. She wasn't fucking with me at all. So let's get started with Diane Sherman Young and that awful day, May twenty first of nineteen eighty eight, when. She was found just destroyed in her car in a field. Diane Sherman Young's sister, Linda Sherman Rincheck, is married to Al Rincheck, and she was the one holding out the torch for Diane's case. And she really just beating the drum, and no one would listen to her for a while until the coroner was convinced, at the time, the coroner at the time, John Evans, was convinced to have an inquest. Uh, she held out until her own very early, untimely death. This, The Sherman family, it's be- four beautiful daughters, and they are all gone now, and they all died very young, way too young. Linda died unexpectedly at the age of 49, and her husband has picked up the mantle. But Linda said, in dysfunctional families, violence, alcoholism, tragedies happen. I couldn't see that before, but now I'm seeing clearly. And I can't imagine that that quote could be any more timely than talking about Diane's case. She encompasses Diane's case 
in those sentences. It just, it's, it's like, this is like a bad episode of Dallas without oil money. It's a uh, small town, Indiana. It's, you know, dogs and cats living together. It's uh, apocalyptic. It's family members marrying other family members. It's a, it's a goddamn fucking mess is what it is. I've never seen anything so layered and weird in my entire life. Linda also says, this isn't an issue about me holding out the torch for my sister's death. The issue is there's a 22-year-old girl robbed of her life and motherhood. My goal is to get arson killers behind bars. So 22-year-old Diane Sherman Young, mother of an almost four-year-old boy, Nicholas, married to Scott Young, and she was working at 7-Eleven. She is a young girl with a family, and she it, she has the same issues that every 22-year-old woman who's working has a child, has a husband, has a family, all of the same things she's going through, we all have. None of these things would have been an impetus for suicide. She had gotten a raise at her job at 7-Eleven because of her outstanding work. And the boss said, you know, don't tell anyone. No one else is getting a raise but you. And a few weeks after her raise, the boss called her in, May 21st, and said, other people are talking about your raise, you told them. And she was furious that he would have thought she would have betrayed his trust. She left her work shift after it was over, stomped out, went to a friend's house, called a few people to complain, not you know, screaming and yelling, I'm going to drive off the side of the road, nothing like that. She was just furious that he had doubted, the boss had doubted her, you know, veracity that somehow other people have found out about her raise, but it wasn't her. You know, she wasn't going to be fired. It wasn't a huge tragedy. It was just a, an event in her day that upset her. It's the kind of shit that happens when you work at 7-Eleven. Yes. You know? And you're 22. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of ways that your coworkers could find out about that sort of Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. I mean, you know, Mr. Rainey, the boss, you know, maybe he left his office door open and maybe somebody saw some timesheets or something. Who knows? But it wasn't, It this was not an event. She'd been through enough in her life. This was not an event that would have driven her to end it, is all I'm trying to say. So a few hours after that, that's about three in the afternoon on this Saturday, few hours after that, a man was driving his pickup truck slowly past a farm in Valparaiso, and he had some grandkids in the back of the truck, so he was driving slowly. And he noticed a blue mid-sized sedan in the middle of a field uh, about uh, 5.45 p.m. that same night, 21st of May. He drops off the grandkids, and he comes back the opposite direction, still driving slowly, even though the kids aren't in the open pickup truck, and he notices that the car's on fire. So he, in the middle of a field, he is the one who originally reports the fire. It is on property owned by the Petersons, a father and son, and they have leased out the property for the young family to farm. There are two members of Diane's family, her brother-in-law, Mike, and her husband, Scott, who work on this piece of property. That's not unheard of. Um, my grandparents owned a farm in Gallatin County, Kentucky, and they had um, sort of a, a supervisor who they grew tobacco, and he farmed the land and took care of it for them. It happens quite often. So these, this, these family members are using property owned by another family to farm. Diane's 1984 Pontiac Phoenix is completely engulfed in flames. And by the time that the fire department gets there, it's worse than they could have imagined. They were at first worried about a car fire starting a large brush fire in this farm. And if you know anything about Indiana, it's flat and fires can race pretty pretty quickly across that kind of flatland. 
Fire department gets there noticing that a two-gallon gas can was about three feet from the car and had gotten so hot that the handle had melted off and was on the ground. They noticed after putting out the fire, there is a body in the driver's seat that is mostly disintegrated. There was no flesh left, many bones gone. And the only part that was sort of left, which we'll discuss a little bit in depth later, was her skull in the upper torso. There was still a necklace around her neck. There was a ring in the console, and there was a 22 caliber Ruger on the floor of the passenger seat. The car itself was really uh, of little use, um, evidentiary value. The metal and glass had melted. The fire was so intense that the driver's side window, which had been rolled down and was inside in between the door, had melted inside the door. That's how hot this fire was. That's really something. The only information I got from the Porter County Sheriff's Office was an eight-page incident report, which was basically like pulling teeth to get. But what it had was the original officers, responding officers' investigation, their interpretation of what happened. And they believed that it couldn't have gotten so large without an accelerant. And then they find, you know, a can, an empty can with the lid off and the handle melted off of it close to the car. There had been accelerant poured on the outside of the car. There had been accelerant poured all over the inside of the car and all over the victim, 22-year-old Diane Sherman Young. Now, I'm going to say, and I am not an investigator, but if you want to kill yourself, and I pray you don't, because if one of us is hurting, all of us is hurting, and we don't want anyone to be hurting. It happens because of the human journey, but I really hope you don't want to kill yourself. But self-emulating is usually something you do to make a big stand, a big statement. If you're going to kill yourself and you're a woman, approximately 1% of all female suicides involve fire. 1%. And I will be honest, that's uh, bigger than I thought. Yeah, <laughs> I thought, does, no, that doesn't seem <laughs> right at all. I thought it would be a uh, negative percent, but 1% of female suicides involve involve fire. Uh, and, and additionally low percentage involve firearms. And this one involved both, presumably. Both. Presumably. Yes. And, I, I mean, I, you know, we could debate this all day long, but women typically do something a little less um, messy, uh, we had uh, a discussion, producer Mark and I had a discussion with a lovely young girl at a, a local establishment, and she's very young, and immediately she said, oh, yeah, you don't want to leave a mess. You don't, you don't want to leave a messy corpse. That's, that's right. Yeah, yeah she, right. You, know, you don't want to fuck up your face. So I don't know if that's true or not, but it, it makes as much sense as anything else. Women will tend to take pills um, or turn the gas on. They're not, they, they want something soft and quiet to end their life. I'm not giving anyone ideas or I pray I'm not because it's all awful. But a 22 year old mother whose son's going to turn four in three weeks, she's putting things on layaway for his birthday. She's picking up party supplies. She's angry at her boss. She's living her life. She's unhappy in her marriage. It's not, just not suicide fodder. It's just not. And not that way. In and any not ev- that in any way. Event. And you're exactly right, Producer Mark. And I have talked to many people, including uh, one of my favorite uh, gun aficionado detectives, who we will be speaking with, uh, Detective Joe, uh, probably in late January, early February. But I called him for advice because I am researching this and researching this. And I have to say one of the one of the joys of this case being covered so well by the press is a woman named Susan Brown, who 
uh, was a journalist for the Northwest Indiana Times. I don't, I can't find her. I've tried just to tell her I adore her. She is an excellent writer. She is an excellent journalist. So Susan Brown, if you're out there, you are magnificent and you write in a way, a journalistic style that is so compelling. It's straightforward. There's nothing gushy or gooey about it. But she asks, I mean, she's not gushy or gooey like me, but she asks the questions that a reader wants answered before we know we have them. She's that, that kind of journalist. And she has covered this case so remarkably well. Honestly, the most information I got was a combination of her articles and also from the coroner's inquest. Those are, there's articles galore about, about this case but it's it's really Susan Brown's journalistic integrity that makes everything gel for me. And tracing back, it just doesn't seem that Diane had any reason to do this to herself in the manner that she did this to herself. And it would have been an almost impossibility for her to have done both things to herself. It just, I mean... I guess one could set themselves on fire and then shoot themselves. I don't, I don't. <laughs> Seems like you might be a little distracted. Yeah. Yeah. With the fire with and the all. Fire. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just, none of, I, I don't, I don't understand anything anymore in life. I'm, I'm spending way too much of my time scratching my head. Like how, how does this happen? There have been many people agencies who in, have investigated this case. It was taken on, you know, away uh, or handed off from the Porter County Sheriff's Office to the Indiana State Police. At one point, they handed the case back when there had been a cold case unit that had gotten some funding. The FBI came in and the FBI uh, had an analysis of women who, you know, would kill themselves and in what manner. And the FBI was like, this is not, this is not a suicide. <laughs> this is absolutely homicide. And I'm not sure how you can even get to the point where you thought it was suicide. So you find a, you know, a burned gun in the floorboard of the passenger seat that somehow makes you think that the decedent used it on themselves. It just, to me, I mean, I'm, we can debate all of these little fine points until we're, we're sick to death. But the, you know, the, the real point is someone else did this to Diane. I, you know, I don't know how one shoots himself and how a, a gun falls, but the trajectory of the bullet went apparently through her head and then through the, the roof of the car, which is a, it's a 22 Ruger. I spoke to Detective Joe and he said, if you shot a 22 is a small caliber. If you shoot that in your head, it's going to roll around. If you shoot it through the roof of the car into the head, that's a possibility. The weird part is the bullet was never found. The gun was so damaged that they tried to recreate it, how it could have happened. And the best they could do was x-ray the gun to see the workings because it had been so damaged by the fire. So, in other words, she she if she if she had shot herself, the the bullet would have stayed in her head, or so would have probably not gone anywhere. That is what I understood. And, but but if somebody had shot from above, from above the car roof, there's a possibility, probably a good one, that it went through that way down into her head. Yes, but she was too badly burned for anybody to determine the entrance and exit of the bullet. Is that correct? Yes. Oh. That is that is the problem. And the FBI said, obviously, part of the problem here is the lack of training that a local small fire department would have as far as preserving evidence. And I'm not holding anything against, you know, fire departments or EMTs in small areas because they save lives every day. But when you have someone who shoots, potentially, allegedly, shoots someone and sets them on fire, fire is a bitch. 
when you are trying to preserve evidence. Yeah, they're not going to have any Michael Bodens on staff. Right, uh, right. Yeah. A- and, you know, unfortunately, there was um, discrepancies as far as where her purse was, where the gas can was. Understandably, if you're in the fire department and you show up and there's uh, an incendiary situation and there's a gas can near, I mean, I guess when you pick it up, you can figure out it's empty, but they moved the gas can. Um, Diane's purse was found 48 feet west of the car, sitting upright in a field. Okay, so she left <laughs> she left her purse 48 feet away from the car, then went to the car, uh, lit, lit herself on fire and shot herself. Right. Uh-huh. Now, l- listen... When I'm first reading, what you're saying is absolutely correct, Producer Mark. But when I'm reading the inquest, I'm thinking to myself, all right, maybe she wants to leave her purse far enough away from the fire that they know it's her, that it's an identification. You know, maybe. It's interesting the way that the description from responding law enforcement as well as from the fire department Everyone said the same thing. The purse was just sitting upright like it had been gently laid there. There was no evidence that it had been thrown or tossed in any way, shape, or form. It was just sitting upright in a field like it was just waiting for someone to find it. I guess she could have left it there. Right. Well, but... I think the big question is, if you want to commit suicide, do you need to... uh, destroy all the evidence no right if you want to commit suicide you probably want someone to find you maybe you don't want it to be someone you love or your family member but you don't care about (laughs) about evidence you don't need to set yourself on fire right and then shoot yourself while making sure your purse is upright in a field and the can is only a can, an empty gas can at this point is only three feet from your car. Yeah, I, you know, what it sounds like is that somebody killed her and said, I got to make this look like a suicide. So I'm going to take her purse and leave it way far away because it'll look like she was trying to, you know, to do this. I, I just bingo. It's, it's just, and it sounds like something that, frankly, that a, a man, a very a man who thinks he's clever would do. Bingo. So. Yeah, so I think you're. I think you're onto it. So we're back to what the actual physical evidence at the scene is, where she, what, where she died. So right? the right, and and what you need is a victimology of who would kill themselves in this way. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Didn't happen, or why someone else would have had a reason to kill her. Right. So the original coroner's verdict was that she died from thermo burns and smoke inhalation due to a car fire. And the manner of death was undetermined. So now, 11 years later, there's a supplement, uh, a supplemental to her death certificate that says uh, it's homicide at the hands of another or others unknown. So yeah, uh, I don't, I don't know why it took uh, that long, but they, you know, they changed it. And here's a few details that are, you know, could change how you think of things or could solidify how you think of things. Diane was married to Scott Young. Scott is from a, you know, well-known family in the area. They, uh, the family owned a thermo insulation company. You know, they're, they're well-known in a small town, but they're not, no one's, no one's rolling in the dough here. These are, you know, uh, farmers who've made a good living and can take care of their family and, and give their kids money sometimes. One of the heartbreaking things is that apparently Diane and Scott got married after she got pregnant, very young, sounds like high school. And a young man in town who comes into play, his name is Mark Huff. He feels guilty that Diane married Scott. And the reason why he feels guilty is that Scott had asked him to procure some condoms for him while he was uh, at his home with Diane. And Mark went to the store to buy some condoms for Scott. And by the time he came back, they'd already had sex and she ended up getting pregnant and they ended up getting married. 
Oh. Now, Mark shouldn't blame himself for that incident. Uh, it wasn't his fault that Scott wasn't prepared. It wasn't his fault that they didn't wait. And it wasn't his fault that Diane got pregnant. What is um, unfortunate and complicated is that in 1988, if you are gay or bisexual in a small town in Indiana, you probably keep that to yourself. And Mark Huff, I, you know, after reading the coroner's inquest, I was like, is he just the one town gay that everyone, you know, it's just so, it's so awful and ugly and it doesn't matter who sleeps with who, unless of course it's uncomfortable in your relationship and you have a, a wife or a girlfriend. So Scott Young had had relationships, uh, a physical relationship with Mark Huff. Mike Young, Scott's older brother, had had a relationship with Mark Huff. Doesn't matter. Oh, okay. It's uh, a, it's their personal business. Right. In my mind, it's their. I don't give a shit. Mike Young is married, unfortunately, to <laughs> Diane's sister Susan. So two brothers are married to two sisters. It's a little confusing. It's there. so awful, and here's why I thought the original family member tipster had lost her ever loving fucking mind because she's trying to explain it to him. And I'm like, this doesn't even make sense. Why is everybody fucking everybody else? And they're all related, but it's in a small town. You don't have a lot to choose from. Um, I asked tipster David, if I could use this phrase, because I just don't think this is the way life works. But tipster David said the difference between a gay guy and a straight guy in a small town in Indiana is four beers. <laughs> Okay. So I don't think that's the way it works, but again, I don't know. I'm smart enough to know that sexuality is much more fluid than uh, I ever could imagine, and that, you know, this isn't college experiments because no one went to college there, but they're still pretty young. Now, later on, uh, Detective Weeks, under oath, said that Mark Huff at first denied having a relationship with Mike Young and with Scott Young. And finally admitted it. Scott Young and Mike Young admitted under oath they had both had a physical relationship with Mark Huff. Susan Young, the older sister of Diane, who has been murdered potentially by her brother-in-law and husband, said when questioned, did you know that your husband had a physical relationship with Mark Huff? And she said, oh, yeah, he told me about that. It's no big deal. Okay. And her answer was, I think Mark's M.O. is he would get guys drunk at parties and then solicit them. Okay. So maybe David's theory's right. Maybe it takes four beers and Mark Huff's your guy. I don't know. I feel really awful and sad saying that because it doesn't matter who fucks who. Unless you fuck them and then kill them. And then it matters. Don't kill them. Fuck them all you want. I don't care who you fuck. That's up to you and your genitals. And if it's you're over, you know, over 18 and it's you're consenting, have at it. But, you know, don't don't kill people. I don't I don't want to say Scott kills Diane because he's on the down low. I don't I don't know. I have I don't know. It could have just been something that happened in high school that didn't continue to happen. It sounds like it happened more more often with Mike Young. But again, I don't know. Detective Weeks goes under oath and says, Scott Young told me in the first or second interview with him that his brother Mike had molested him all through high school. Now, again, that's just a statement from Scott Young, but it sounds like the family had more issues in their tissues than I can even, I can imagine. Oh, man. So... Back to Diane, she is having an affair with a co-worker at 7-Eleven. And this man, Jim Ansonek, loves her very much. In fact, he buys her wedding rings, an engagement ring and a wedding band. Even though she's still married to Scott and has made, you know, no proclamation to him that she's getting a divorce. He knows she's unhappy. He loves Diane and wants to marry her. Man, my head is spinning right now. I know. There's so many wow. people. Can you understand how 
when I got this case, you know, handed to me <laughs> four, four months ago, I was like, I'm never getting through this labyrinth. But if you hang with me, I'm hoping you'll get it. And the, just try to remember the important part is Diane's case is unsolved. And it does not deserve to be. It deserves to be solved. And it can be solved because I'm quite sure somebody out there knows something. And I just, I know it can be solved. So Diane and her co-worker Jim are having an affair. A few weeks before Diane is murdered, Jim borrows a gun, a 22 Ruger, because he's being followed by someone in a red car. He is convinced of it. Uh, he is also young in his 20s. And he is convinced someone in a red car is following him, possibly because he's having an affair with Diane. At some point, not long before Diane is murdered, he gives the gun to Diane and says, I feel like I'm being followed, but I want you to be safe too. And gives her the gun. Now, Scott finds the gun and says, why do you have a gun and who gave you this? And she said, oh, it's a friend of a friend. He borrowed it and he gave it to me for protection. And Scott admits in interviews with Detective Weeks, yeah, I took it outside and shot it and it, I couldn't really get it to shoot. And uh, I tried to show Diane how to shoot it and she couldn't figure it out. Now, later on, Jim Ansonek says, I don't think Diane knew how to even chamber a bullet. I don't think she could have used the gun. That's his testimony, that even though he gave her the gun, if she needed it for protection from Scott or maybe his family members who were, you know, uh, watching her and trying to get info on her about her having an affair, he said he didn't think she even knew how to, how to use it. The first two interviews with Detective Weeks, Scott says things like that his brother molested him and that... Um, Here's the way you would you would know that the body, it's her car, it's registered to us. Here's how you know for sure that it's her. Her wedding rings and a specific necklace I gave her for Christmas a few years ago. She never took it off. That's how you'll know it's her if you find those items. So now the detectives find no wedding rings on Diane and a necklace, but not the necklace that Scott had purchased for her. Okay, wow. Okay, this is... Very few details, very few pieces of jewelry that she owned, and these were important to her, and she wore them every day. And neither piece was found on her in the car. By the third interview, the detective has found out that that specific necklace had been sold to the Valparaiso pawn shop for $40 because they were unable to make their car payment the month before. Oh, and was it Diane that hocked it? Yep. Oh, okay. okay. And Scott knew because they got in a fight over it. Oh. But he denied that, the first two interviews. And when the detective called him on it and said, so do you know where her wedding rings are? Nope. Well, they weren't found on her. I don't know where they were. We did find a necklace on her, but it's not the one you described. Huh. But you know what? The necklace you described was pawned by Diane at the Valparaiso pawn shop. And they said you knew because you got in a fight with her. Oh, I forgot that. So they had a fight at the pawn shop uh -huh. about it? He, he had called the pawn shop to get the necklace back. I see. It's $320 was the value from, and tipster David will love this because we had a fight over where you would buy jewelry from Montgomery Ward. I said Montgomery Ward. He said service merchandise. So it was Montgomery Ward and he had purchased this $320 gold chain for her a few Christmases before and she never took it off. But a few weeks before she was murdered, that necklace was pawned for $40 so she could make up the money they didn't have for the car payment. Okay. So he's he was lying. His story changes. His story changes, which I think you never want to happen if your spouse is murdered. I'm not saying you have to keep 
all your T's crossed and your I's dotted because we're human beings. We remember things differently. You know, oh, you know what? Uh, Maybe it wasn't a blue dress. Maybe it was a black dress. But when you know the few items of jewelry your wife has and you tell detectives, here's how you'll identify her, and you know those items are not on her, I, I, I don't know how that makes you look anything other than just ridiculously guilty. Ridiculously guilty. Of course. So if you're wondering what could have been a motive for Scott to have done something this awful to the mother of his son, to his wife, Detective Weeks has quite a few theories lined up. And they're all so sad. So sad. There was a $25,000 insurance policy written on Diane. And after one year, there's a suicide clause that if you commit suicide, your beneficiary gets all the money. Right. You have have the first year that suicide will not pay out. But after the first year, that they they will pay out. I'm glad you said that, Producer Mark, because I was under the impression most people who commit suicide, their family members do not get insurance. But I'm glad you knew that because I thought this had to have been a unique type of insurance. No, it it it's it depends. Not all life insurance policies have that uh, availability, but right. they, there are many that do. That say after the first year, if there's if suicide is involved, then they will pay out. Well, that's exactly what happened, and Scott was aware <laughs> aware of the clause, and it had been about thirteen months since they had signed. <laughs> oh boy! For okay. a twenty five thousand dollar insurance policy. Yeah. He also received $5,000 for the burned car. So for a total of $30,000, Diane Sherman Young was murdered. At least according to Detective Weeks. It's just one motive. It's one of the motives. And it's the saddest. That's the saddest thing ever. Killing for money is, is something I can't imagine. But Killing your spouse and the mother of your child for something so small is heartbreaking. But let me explain how money may have been way more important than I can imagine. Even though this is 1988 in small town Indiana, apparently if you call anyone uh, five miles from your house, it's long distance. And I remember, you know, having to pay some long distance bills when I had friends who lived, in my opinion, further away than that. But it was almost like anything other than calling your own house, you would have had, you know, a bill. Well, that's not just in small town Indiana. For a while there, we all, it's, it's been so long since, since the long distance um, rules have changed and technology's changed. But I remember when I was in my early 20s, um, calling, calling people uh, even... Well, less than 10 miles away would have been a toll call. Yeah. Been, yeah. Okay, apparently that, that really, you know, in 19, I think, I think what's shocking to me is that it was 1988. Apparently that was still in play in oh, Indiana. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because Diane had been calling her paramour from 7-Eleven, Jim, who lived about five miles away, but they had ended up in one month racking up and and the amounts change, but between three hundred and five hundred dollars. Wow! And, and phone, yeah. And he Scott got the bill, according to some, and blew his fuse. Um, she said she was calling a friend, girlfriend, who happened to live at the same house where Jim was. I think it was a series of roommates who lived there, and she said she was calling a friend and named Chris and he Scott called the house and there was someone named Chris there but then he sort of I think put two and two together and figured out it was really Jim that she was calling so now if they're having so much trouble paying bills that she has to pawn one of her only good pieces of jewelry for $40 to cover the car payment where do you think she got the money to pay off the $500 phone bill yeah. She got the money from her brother-in-law Mike. Uh, 
I see. She got the $500, depending on who it is you ask, from her brother-in-law, Mike, to pay the phone bill. And the theory is she got the money from Mike by saying she was going to blackmail him and tell everyone about his relationship with Mark Huff. Oh, my God. I don't, I don't know if that's true. Uh, okay. Um, Mike had about $75,000 in farm equipment that he was attempting to pay off. He didn't seem worried about it and seemed like he could do it. At one point, he said that Diane had alternately made a pass at him at a family event, uh, grabbing his leg under the table like at Thanksgiving. And they had had a, you know, make-out session behind the barn after dinner. But that's as far as it went. He said that she would have wanted it to go further, but that he stopped her. He said that he told his wife, Susan, Diane's sister, your Diane, your sister Diane hit on me. This Mike guy's just a fascinating cat, isn't he? Mm-hmm. It, I, I mean, I really... The coroner's inquest was like reading a really bad romance novel set in small town Indiana. It was, it was really uncomfortable. So the the motives could be money, uh, the fact that Scott thought that Diane was having an affair and she was. The fact, I shouldn't say fact because I don't know this to be a fact, but a theory that Detective Weeks had was that. Diane had asked Scott for divorce and he was scared that he would not get custody of their son, Nicholas, who his family calls Scotty. I'm guessing his name is Nicholas Scott or Scott Nicholas, but everyone else called the baby Nicholas and he, his family calls the baby Scotty. He was worried that he would not get custody of Scotty because of the relationship with Mark Huff. And, aye, aye, aye. Yeah. And that he and his brother Mike got together and came up with this idea. Now the gas can. The, the minute when you find out that Diane purchased a gas can at three in the afternoon on May 21st, I think, oh, she was planning to kill herself. Well, <laughs> she went to several different places, all of these different gas stations in the Kouts area, at, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, K-O-U-T-S, the Hebron area, and the Valparaiso area, all of these areas together. She went to four different um, gas stations, and they didn't have gas cans, but she found a True Value hardware store, and they had a two-gallon gas can that a female cashier remembered selling to Diane, said she was pleasant, said she it was like $2.13 or something. So she's looking through her purse to find the exact change. She takes it to a gas station to be filled. And while it's being filled, she said, I'd like to buy a pack of cigarettes. And and the gas station said, oh, we don't have them here, but across the street that that store does. So she walked across the street, got a pack of cigarettes and a Bic lighter. And I'm thinking, oh, she bought a big lighter so she can set herself on fire. No, she bought a can of gas because someone asked her to, to bring it to the farm oh, for yeah. gas for the equipment. Mike. Or Scott. Or Scott. Or both. So. She shows up to her own murder with uh, the elements uh, that make it look like she's committed suicide. Okay, now more and more it's just looking like these two brothers, boy, what a horrible, horrible, oh my God. Right. Right. And the family protects them. The family shows up for them and protects them, including Susan, her, Diane's older sister, who's married to Mike Young, who, by the way, divorces him not long after Diane's murder. But when police officers find out there's been a separation and a family, and Susan would have been the perfect person 
to get a hold of. You always oh, yeah. want to get a hold of the ex, the ex girlfriend, and say, and she was undecided on if she would comment. That was the the official word. Susan Young is undecided whether she wants to comment. <laughs> and, so, and she never has? Susan died of cirrhosis of the liver at the age of 48. Right. God. Okay. All right. The theory is she would not have commented that her husband and brother-in-law, her husband at the time and brother-in-law, had killed her sister because she had a son and she was worried that if she commented they would lose custody of the son and she would lose custody of her son because of her participation in protecting him. Good grief. Yeah, that's that's the theory. These are th- all I'm giving you are theories now. I have no proof of anything. It all adds up to be something ugly and and a family that you know needed so much help. I mean, there isn't enough psychology to help this family. I, I mean, I don't, unless they all just moved away from each other and went to separate parts of the world. I just, I can't, I, I don't know how you get past things like this, but I can tell you that Linda, Diane's older sister, who has also passed away, all of the girls, the four, the four Sherman girls are gone in very young and in very odd ways. Diane, the youngest and the most odd, but the other girls are all gone. And Linda has held out the torch the longest until her very quick, untimely death, which they really believe she had a a big series of health issues they really believe was from the stress of her sister's murder being unsolved. Her sister being murdered at the age of 22 and no one really, you know, given a shit. Nobody caring, nobody, you know, wanting to pin someone down. And I mean, I just... Well, and the fact that Unless I'm missing something, her other sister, who was married to Mike, won't help. Yep. I mean, that's got to break her heart. I mean, yep. I think she. I think she did die brokenhearted. She would constantly speak with the press, not only Susan Brown but anyone who would listen. You know, she and her husband Al uh, and other family members would protest in front of the police department. They're the ones who put Diane's you know, uh, the 187 page inquest in the in the libraries. One of the things besides the complexity of the case that bothered me so much is that it was unfortunately from the state of Indiana. And I'm just going to have to tell you tipsters that the state of Indiana is abysmal, not the state, the state's a lovely state, the law enforcement, the police agencies, investigative services in Indiana are awful. Were those the people you kept screaming at after you hung up the phone? (laughs) Uh, producer Mark has probably heard this saga. It's It's been about uh, four months, I think, that uh, for about four months ago that we got the message from um, the lovely listener. And I thought, all right, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to try. And I kept trying and I kept wanting to uh, annihilate most of the state. And I would get passed around. Uh, this particular uh, law enforcement agency is the Porter County Sheriff's uh, Department. That's where this poor woman uh, had the terrible misfortune of being murdered in their jurisdiction. Uh, back when she was murdered in 1988, I think the law enforcement was probably more on top of it. Even for their um, for their troubled um, agency, they, I just couldn't believe the way I was treated. So. Not like I'm anyone, but I'm someone asking about an unsolved case. And at first I was given to some sort of admin for the investigations department, and she could not have been less helpful. And then she passed me off to the PIO, the uh, public information officer, which any of you who've, who have had the terrible misfortune of having to ask about a case, uh, whether it's someone you know or a family member, if you've had to get any information from a law enforcement agency when they pass you to the public information officer it's kind of like you know that scene from tropic thunder where my beloved tom cruise plays a studio head and he's on the phone with someone and he says literally take a step back and then he screams and fuck your own face which is basically what (laughs) That's what they're telling you, to just go fuck your own face. <laughs> yeah, you could almost see him on the other end doing that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's If you haven't seen Tropic Thunder, 
I beg of you because it's a masterpiece of of comedy and the way the entertainment industry works. Um, however, I basically was told to go fuck my own face by numerous members of the Porter County Sheriff's Office. I will say the public information officer is a sweet man, and he tried, but not hard enough. He really didn't. I just, I don't, and maybe all of his hands are tied. Maybe his, you know, 27 tentacle hands are tied. I don't know. But when I called, he he's very young, and he knew nothing about the case. Um, and I said, it's pretty big, pretty big case. I mean, you know, you guys were called to task. I understand it was probably before you were born, but it's probably a big case you ought to know about, unsolved. And he's like, yeah, I'm not familiar with any of these names you're giving me. And a, mm, a day later, he emailed me back and he's like, oh my God, you're right. It's a huge case. Yeah, thanks, Opie. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks, Opie. So he didn't, you know, he tried. I'm just, I'm not going to slam him because he can't help, you know, who he works for, I guess. I don't know. But I was furious. I wrote him a nasty, after I got just, you know, complete stonewalling, I wrote him kind of a nasty email <laughs> and then signed it yours in Christ because that's what I do. It makes me happy. But um, <laughs> just, <laughs> I said, thanks for nothing. You're terrible, awful people. Yours in Christ, Melissa Morgan. So that makes it all better. It doesn't make it better at all. It makes it worse. But um, I was about to head toward the Indiana State Police uh, and and talk to them because they had at one point had the case and they're just the worst. They're worse than even the small town uh, sheriff's departments. They are awful. So I, it was just like, a I don't know what struck my head, but a last ditch effort because of the problems of this case. Uh, the, the tipster who'd sent me the message about the case said, you know, there was a coroner's inquest. And I'm like, oh, oh. So I called the coroner's office and got a hold of a goddess who cares. And she's very humble. I don't want to name her name, but I'm going to call her D, just the letter D. And she said, oh, yeah, I know that case. And I thought, how fucking interesting is it that someone who works for the coroner's office and started there almost 20 years ago knew the name of the case and the person the second I said it and not she's not in law enforcement. She works for the coroner's office. I mean, she, it, but she said when she started, this is the person she is. She said when, they st when she started there, she grabbed any file she could where there was an unsolved case, an unusual case, something that struck her as different or weird. And she was very familiar with this case, very familiar with this case. So we had a lovely conversation, many lovely conversations. I asked for a copy of the coroner's inquest. I said, it's public record. She said, there's... The, the coroner's inquest was placed in the libraries? And I'm like, yeah, three local libraries by the family members so that citizens could read what the fuck was going on since they felt they weren't getting any justice. They knew who did it. They wanted justice for their family member and they wanted everyone to know about it, which I think is is brilliant and spectacular. Really is, yeah. And it's public record. It's just trying to get it sometimes public records. Yeah, not not easy. And I'll be damned if the goddess D didn't find a librarian who is obviously as much of a goddess as D is. We're going to call her S. And she found it in the genealogy department, made a copy for D, and D made a copy for me. And this is the kind of scruples that D in the coroner's office has. I said, can I pay for uh, the copying, the paper, the time? And she said, you know, we don't even have a way to accept money. <laughs> so I... I don't want to do that. I'll be happy to make a copy of the 187-page coroner's inquest for you. And I said, can I pay for uh, mailing? And she said, you know, just so the taxpayers of Indiana don't have to pay for this out of our office, if you have a FedEx number, I'd be happy to take it. And that's where uh, the amazing producer, Mark, who has uh, so many things at his fingertips, said, oh, my gosh, I have a FedEx account I haven't used in a while. Let me reactivate it. And he did, and we, you know, paid whatever the amount was to have the 187 pages sent to us. And I spent a large part of December <laughs> going over it and over it and over it. Boy, that's for sure. But I just, I just have to back up and say, every, I, I've heard this story again now. <laughs> it really is amazing to me that after all the shit you went through with the bureaucrats in, in the in law enforcement, mm -hmm. you know, that that. The one person that was able to help you was someone who's really, it's not her job not to, at all. to know that stuff. Absolutely. To do that stuff. That she was so 
interested in it and helpful that she went and used her own time to find a librarian at the public library, which her department has nothing to do with. Absolutely. And found a librarian who also cared, who uh, that has nothing to do with her job either. Absolutely. To help you get what you needed so that you could do the research you needed. So, you know, while Indiana law enforcement sucks, I think uh, at least uh, several of the people who live there are just great people. Are gems. So knowing that D is an amazing human being and that S at the library is an amazing human being, um, we are grateful that we have the information that we have. I will also tell you that the first responding detective has passed away. He died in uh, 2017, but he is was part of the was questioned, you know, extensively in this coroner's inquest, and he was very vocal during his time with uh, the police department and after retiring, saying that we missed something. This case was bungled. We made mistakes. He said this, and he was the first responding detective. There were other patrolmen and firemen who who responded, but he was the first responding detective. And he, he was a, a, you know, a terrific guy. He, after retiring from the police department, he started a polygraph interpretation company in Valparaiso, Indiana, and he passed away in 2017. And I will tell you, I do not know if we're going to get to speak to one of his um, co-workers who also showed up on the scene, because according to D, he has uh, been having some health issues and he has been going back and forth to the doctor quite a bit. So I, I do know people from the coroner's office in Porter County are reaching out to other people that may know information about the case to potentially, you know, talk to us on a follow-up episode, but it, you know, it's just, it's up in the air right now, but I can tell you that off the record, several people in the coroner's office said and I quote, this case needs to be solved, and it can be solved. Al still contacts, you know, the police department and the coroner's uh, department, coroner's office. You know, any any news on Diane's case? Any any news? And and there isn't the, any. The police aren't working on it? I mean, it, Well, it, it, I mean, how do you work on a 32-year-old cold well, case? Fair enough, but I mean, uh, the thing that's getting me is... Until you told me that they now know that that the purchase of the gas can and the lighter were clearly a ruse to get her to bring those things to these two guys. I mean, it's, I think... How that, do you know? Uh, you, you you can't say they know that. They're this just is, assuming it? Yes. This is what Detective Weeks said. Here's his summation at the end of the coroner's inquest. I believe someone lured Diane Sherman Young to that field the field that her husband and brother-in-law farmed, with the ruse of needing gas for some equipment. I believe she was unconscious at the time of the fire. They potentially shot her in the head first. She still had breathing at some point. He did not, it could not be confirmed if it was voluntary or involuntary, like if the lungs could still be moving involuntarily because she wasn't quite dead yet. Because they found there were smoke. and Yes. Uh, You know, but it was so, everything was so badly damaged by the fire, you can't possibly say this is definitive and that's definitive. If you can't tell, you know, they didn't find the bullet. If you can't tell if the bullet went in her head and out the the roof of the car, or in the roof and out, even though we know it probably didn't start in her head, it would have stayed there. You know, if you can't say definitively those things, how can you say definitively that Scott Young or Mike Young right. asked okay. her to bring a can of gas to the field? Fair. I get it. And that's just that's just horrible. So really, what, and are Mike, is Mike still alive? Yep. And is Scott still alive? Yep. So really what it comes down to is somebody, like you say, somebody knowing something, somebody yep. hearing something from one of those two brothers or both that would, that would be evidence, you know, direct evidence. Yep. But, and if, if honestly, if anyone within the sound of my voice, and you don't have to be in Indiana, you can be anywhere. And if you know anything about this, please let us know. Please let 
the Porter County Sheriff's Office know, because I can't think of any, any way better to sum up the help that's needed in this case than a quote from Linda Sherman Rinchek thanking people after a memorial for her sister, Diane. She says a special thank you to the person in Chesterton who made a quilt in memory of my sister Diane with the Bible verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 26, and whether one member suffers, all the members suffer with them. And that's the bottom line. When one person's unsolved murder continues, we need to help close that. If you know anything at all about the unsolved murder of Diane Sherman Young from May of 1988, please call the Porter County Sheriff's Office at 219-477-3000. That's 219-477-3000. Or you can even anonymously email them at Porter County Sheriff Altogether One Word dot com and more cowbell. And remember, if you'd like to support the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash just the tipsters.